Well, good morning, y'all. So glad you can join us from your living rooms. We're here together uh, to worship. Just encourage you to open your heart to Jesus, what he's doing in your family, in your home, all across the world. Um, that we would meet with him this morning. We would hear his voice and we would respond rightfully in worship. So if you join us in singing. stop working never stop never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working never stop 
never stop working, never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. You never stop.
Lord, we will just bow down. We're just gonna stay still. In the 
Loving God, we open our hearts and we receive what you would have for us, this blessing. God, we open our hearts and we receive your goodness and your love. We ask that you would open up our eyes and ears to see and hear, God, the ways that you are creatively giving of yourself in this time, God, the ways that we might not expect, but God, we, uh, we just ask for open eyes and open ears to see the ways that you're moving, God. So we trust you, and we receive now. Thank you, in your name, amen. Happy Sunday, Church of the City, Sylvan Park. It's so good to be with you this morning. Um, I'm Rachel Garrett. I'm the Director of Experience here at Church of the City, Sylvan Park. And man, it is an honor to get to worship with you every week. Um, if you aren't already set up to be giving online, you can head to churchofthecity.com slash give. I want to encourage you to sign up that way. Um, there you'll be able to set up automatic payments if that is more at your speed. Or if you um, prefer the act of physical giving, you can set up an account and then actually just give manually whenever um, you choose to uh, do your tithes and offerings, whether monthly or with every paycheck, um, whatever is best for you. But we are just always seeking to be a church and a community that gives and gives generously with what the Lord has entrusted us with. Um, generosity is actually one of our seven values here at Church of the City. And even in the midst of this season, we want to continue to be a church that pours resources into our communities and our neighborhoods and partners um, and supports our 24 missional partners. As most of you know, West Nashville Dream Center is one of those missional partners who have done and continue to do tremendous, tremendous work um, in the West Nashville and North Nashville neighborhoods. Um, through your generous giving and our on ongoing tithes and offerings, we're able to help provide resources to families um, through the West Nashville Dream Center who are in need of support and groceries, especially in the midst of the season where there's a lot of jobs and economic loss. Um, part of the truckload of food that we purchased last week actually went to the West Nashville Dream Center already for them to distribute as they see fit. Um, I just want to thank you for continuing to give so that we can partner as a church with what God is doing through this amazing organization. And to the staff at West Nashville Dream Center, I just want you guys to know that we see you, we're for you, we celebrate you, and we love you guys so much. You're doing an amazing job um, with what the Lord has given you. Uh, with recent announcements that parts of our state will begin reopening in phases at the end of this month, you may be wondering when we'll be back to physical gatherings on Sunday mornings. Being mindful of continued health advisories, our leadership team is pressing into this question and we'll provide more information um, as it becomes clear. I just want to urge you be praying alongside of uh, alongside us and our leadership team for wisdom and revelation as to how to move forward in this new season 
season. We are also staying in close contact with the faculty at the Cone School as well as leadership um, within Metro to continue to stay up to date on when we'll be able to re-enter um, the building that we worship in on Sunday mornings. In the meantime, our care team is working hard and tirelessly to continue to provide resources for those experiencing hardship in this season. If you find yourself in need of assistance or if you're able to provide it, I want to urge you to head to churchofthecity.com slash updates and there you'll be able to click the care link um, and you'll also be able to find resources there to join a community group, resources for kids and families, um, along with tons of other things. So go check that out at churchofthecity.com slash updates. All right. I am excited that we're beginning a new series today called As For Me and My House. We will uh, spend the next 10 weeks in the book of Galatians studying the fruit of the spirit as a church family. Before we do that, would you take a moment and text someone that you're thankful for and tell them why? you're thankful for them. When we're back, uh, we'll be joined with the lead pastors from our other four Nashville churches, and they'll be sharing the heart, a little bit of the heart behind this new series. Well, hey, everyone. I'm here with the lead pastors and our executive pastor, and uh, we are kicking off a brand new series today that we've been discussing and developing together. And the series is called As For Me And My House. And uh, as you would guess, we have lifted that phrase from Joshua 24. This is at the end of Joshua's life. And he gives this declaration, choose for you this day whom you will serve. And he responds, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We've been reflecting a lot this last season on what we've lost. You know, we're in the auditorium right now here in Franklin, and I have some sadness that we have not been able to meet for the last seven weeks. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the time where we are back here worshiping together. But as we've been reflecting on what we've lost, we've also been asking ourselves the question, what have we gained? What can we be doing in this season that we have not been able to do? What can we be doing even better in this season? We're in homes, we're in houses. And what can we be doing to be responding together as a family or as friends to the way we worship and the, and the different things that we've been studying in God's word? So we've developed a resource called Around the Table. And uh, this is gonna be a, a resource that we release following each service and it's going to be an opportunity for people to engage in the content together that we have discussed in our worship service. Now, the table has represented a very important environment all throughout the Bible. Matt, tell us a bit about that. It's, it's good to be here with you lads. Yeah, the imagery of table um, for the first 400 years of church, when you think about church, you've got to not think of like a room with chairs and a stage for communicating, that, that came with the Reformation. Anytime you read about church in, in the New Testament, it is people meeting in houses, the center of gravity was definitely the table. And I'm excited for what that means for us up in the city. Um, we, we're in the middle of a pandemic right now, but we've always been in the middle of a pandemic on loneliness. Um, the, the clue um, is, is in Acts 2, where it says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And, and it, it's repeated multiple times that, that the early church would eat and gather together. I think this is uh, great for our folks who are experiencing a tremendous loneliness. Obviously in this season, the hope is that um, for those who can't gather you know, around with their families around the table, this would happen uh, via Zoom. But um, th there's even recent neurobiological research uh, that, that is showing that the happiest that humans can possibly be are gathered around a table eating together, except for when we're gathered around a table outside. I think it's beautiful and this is hopeful for our people. So Derek, what's your hope for this series uh, for those in Spring Hill? Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for this series for us. You know, we say this phrase a lot at uh, Church of the City Spring Hill. We have a lot of young families and we tell them, we say, you parents, are the primary disciples of your children. The church can't do that for you. We can serve you and support you in the process. And in this series, we get to do that. Like we get to operate believing that's true. A another phrase that we say often is that our Sunday morning worship gathering is just an overflow of what God is up to Monday through Saturday. 
what God's doing through our discipleship groups and our support groups. And so in this series, as they gather together and we grow together, we're, we're operating believing that to be true. So I'm excited for the next nine weeks. That's great. Juan, who leads our Spanish-speaking church in Antioch, tell us what's your hope for your folks? Yes, Pastor. So for us during this season, our hope is unity. We have many of those that are part of our church. We all come from different parts of the uh, of the country, not in the U.S. per se. And then having your family rooted elsewhere, when you're somewhere else, and you, even if you've been for a long period of time, church helps you to unify. And we want them to unify through God's word and know that we are an extension of their family. We are their family in Christ. And, and this here is an example of what we want our community to look like, that we all come together as one, knowing that we are with one another. And there's no fear when we're in family. So Jonathan, tell us a bit about this resource, how we've developed it and how people can get hold of it. Yeah, well, first I just want to say I think it's really beautiful that we're all sitting here. It was in January where we sat together around a table and we had one goal, uh, uh, unifying as a church and, and really trying to operate in a way that we're setting families up, that we're setting people up to be the primary disciplers around their sphere of influence. And so what we want to do as a church is really set people up um, to... Um, to honestly be able to disciple their sphere of influence really well. We want to set them up. And so we have a resource that will go out uh, every single week right after the service. And uh, it's going to be an age-appropriate resource. It's going to be lifestyle-appropriate. Go out through the app and also go out to the website. And our hope is that we're setting people up to own um, the opportunity they, they have to, uh, to, to be a priest within whatever household they have. So really excited about doing that. Also in Franklin, we have a lot of young families. We have also empty nesters and single folks. And um, we've really created this resource where it's going to be appropriate for every stage and every age. And uh, one of the things I'm particularly excited about is that uh, at the end of each week, and this is going to be centered around uh, the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians 5, at the end of each week, we're going to have a blessing, a prayer that parents are going to be able to pray over their children and spouses are going to be able to pray over one another and friends can pray over one another over Zoom. Um, but we really hope that this is going to be a, an important moment of, of speaking blessing over one another over these particular issues. So we're going to jump into our text today from Galatians 5 and we're going to read it together. And I'll begin with uh, Galatians 5 starting in verse 13. God's word. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Idolatry and witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. En cambio, el fruto del Espíritu es amor, alegría, paz, paciencia, amabilidad, bondad, fidelidad, humildad, y dominio propio. No hay ley que condene esas cosas. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now we are going to move into the portion of teaching out Galatians 5. Well, good morning, Church of the City, East Nashville, and Sylvan Park. Uh, gosh, uh, I miss you guys. I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. Super pumped uh, about this new series. Uh, in this series, we're exploring the Holy Spirit's role in the process of human transformation. As a pastor, I've always been extremely interested in the question is, is how can I lead? How can I help you? How can I help me become those lovely, one of those lovely spirit-filled 80-year-olds whose life is full of peace and joy and who are essentially a non-anxious 
type of presence. How does this happen? Now, this is by no means an ex, a sophisticated existential question, but it is by no means uh, an important one. In this passage, Paul uses a couple of metaphors that help make this complicated process of human change and becoming a better person easier to understand. In doing so, Paul frames up two distinct modes of living. And the general idea here is that we get to choose whether the operating of system of the flesh or the operating system of the fruit of the Spirit is what will uh, most influence us. And, and the choices you make, whether you live your life uh, in the spirit or in the flesh, have heavy implications. Uh, it occurred to me in my early 30s, um, and I had been following Jesus uh, for over a decade at this point. Um, I'd been attending church regularly. It occurred to me that I w wasn't becoming a better person. Uh, I was cynical, arrogant, short-tempered. I was a guy with Facebook and I wasn't scared to use it. I, 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 this concerned me when I, when I took this kind of deep inner look at, that I wasn't getting better as a person. And, and I, I tried praying. It's all I knew to do that my arrogance and my temper would go away, but it, it just didn't work. What a, what a strange thing. What a strange time this was, attempting to follow Jesus, being regular at church and becoming a worse human being. It's amazing you know, what the pressures of adulthood can bring out in you. And for me, it wasn't pretty. Now, if, if you share some of this story, if, if you feel this inertia towards darkness in you as, as you age, you're in good company. Paul, the author of this passage in, in Galatians, perhaps the greatest Christian thinker ever, self-described like this in Romans 7. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. Paul too battled the flesh. Changing as a human being is not easy. It's a difficult and slow and painful process. And, and the fruit of the Spirit, we've, we've got to be cautious, those of us raised in church. This, this is more than just a children's song. And I know that for some of you, a melody appeared uh, as, as, as Juan read that beautifully uh, in Spanish. The fruit of the Spirit doesn't just appear after a heartfelt rendition of the sinner's prayer. And I should know, man, I, I prayed that a lot in the 90s. Now, to be clear, uh, as we start off in, in this series, um, this is a grace-filled theology um, from Paul. We are not being called uh, to exhaust ourselves uh, in, in good works that God would be pleased with us. Um, I also want to be clear that salvation comes through faith in Jesus alone. And what we're talking about today is, is a little bit different from that. This is about the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And here's something crazy um, that I didn't know as, as a 30-year-old, is, is that we get considerable choice about how accessible our heart is, how accessible our minds are to the work of the Holy Spirit. So as, as we begin, I just want to ask you, um, as you are cooped up in your house in this COVID-19 series, is there a dark trait that is surfacing, that is surfacing in your life be, because... Uh, of the pressure of the situation you're living in. Now, the promise I have for you is that this passage gives you the keys to living free of that, of that trait that you've been trying to shake for years, but it keeps chasing you down. But I do want to ask this of all of us. We need to proceed very cautiously and with a deep humility as we engage with this scripture being fully aware that it's our best thinking that has landed us exactly in the spot that we're in right now. Now, a good starting point, of course, in understanding uh, important passages of Scripture like this is, is that you read the passage in context. The book of Galatians um, can be read out loud in 20 minutes in one sitting. I encourage you to do that uh, this week. But the book of Galatians was actually a letter written to a number of churches in the regions of Galatia, um, and Paul wrote it from a place of deep frustration. You can, you can see this in his language. And he was frustrated because uh, that church was being influenced deeply by some Judaizers from Jerusalem who claimed to be speaking on, on behalf of Jesus' brother and, uh, and demanding that Christians become more Jewish. And this was a massive deal that needed to be solved. You see, uh, as you know, 
Christianity began as a Jewish messianic movement in Jerusalem, but it quickly spread outside of the Jewish centers. And and by the time Paul is writing this letter to the churches in the area of Galatia, there were as many non-Jews as Jewish folks as part of the Jesus movement. And this was causing some very real tension about how are humans meant to behave? How are followers of Jesus meant to live their life? Now, historically, the covenant people of God were focused in in one ethnic group, the people of Israel. And they were set apart by some of the practices commanded in the Torah, like eating kosher food. And what this letter is about is the practice of male circumcision. And there are many Jewish Christians who believe that these non-Jews to truly become a part of God's family, they needed to obey, still needed to obey the laws uh, of the Torah. And so these Judaizers, which basically is a word which means them wanting things to become more Jewish, gained some traction in these Galatian churches and they were demanding circumcision for the Gentile Christians. Yikes. Now, when Paul found out, he was brokenhearted and angry. He was all, you do not have to be physically Jewish to belong to the Messiah's family. Paul was convinced that salvation came through faith in Jesus alone and that Jesus was the true source of righteousness and freedom of living a life with a light yoke. He wanted Christians to enjoy that freedom of Jesus. And this letter is just this response to all of this tension going on. And there were other things going on that were kind of making, you know, helping circumcision make a, make a comeback. There were political reasons. Uh, for one thing, at this time, it was law that the people of the Roman Empire had to pray to Rome and to the emperor. But the Jews, um, the Jewish people had a special exclusion um, from this. They were allowed to pray for Rome and for the emperor. And there was fear among the circumcised Jews that this new religious cult known as Christianity would screw up their religious protection uh, because they also claimed to be children of Abraham. So this was a complicated cultural scenario. The Jewish leaders were legitimately scared that they may lose this protection. So they decided it would be best to have every male to get every male, Jew or Gentile, to be circumcised in order to protect this religious freedom. And in fact, um, this brought about this, the famous confrontation between Paul, the author of this letter, and Peter, the cornerstone of the church, because Peter had started to withdraw from hanging out with Gentile Christians. He'd done it for a while. He was starting to pull back and Paul's going, this is not okay. Paul was kind of on his own in all of this. Um, Paul was angry and he wrote this letter to fix it up. So let's jump into the text, starting at verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Now here you see Paul painting a beautiful picture of how great life can be when your life is apprenticed to the way of Jesus. You are called to be free, he says. Love each other. Be humble. He's saying you can observe all of the rules of the Old Testament by doing one thing. Love your neighbor. Guys, don't argue with each other. He's saying this is, this is a beautiful vision for life following Jesus. And this is how you would achieve it. He says this in verse 16. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And here we find Paul contrasting these two ideas of the choice we get to either walk in the spirit or gratify the desires of of the flesh. And then he acknowledges that this is not easy. This is really hard. In fact, it is like a war. Verse 17, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now here, Paul points out, uh, what the flesh wants is contrary to the spirit. And there is a war going on. What the spirit wants and what the flesh wants are different things. Now, um, 
I doubt that when Paul uses the word flesh here, he means that your physical existence, that your body is bad. Be very careful uh, about getting this right. There's been some weird theology developed over the years that like the human body uh, is bad. Paul, a Jewish rabbi immersed in the Torah, knew that according to Genesis 1, the material world, including humans, at the time of design was very good. Not just good, but very good. Paul knew this. The creation according to God is very good. I say this about you and your body, very good according to God. So this definitely isn't saying that like human bodies are bad or something. And and it means something else, this idea of flesh, which we'll unpack in detail uh, very soon. What happens next is is, is Paul does something that was common uh, amongst Greek, uh, ancient Greek writers, is he, he lists the vices. He lists 15 vices, handily kind of puts them in, into themes. This is very common in ancient literature. And these are the acts of the flesh. And I, and I want you to, to take a searching uh, moral inventory here. Be fearless uh, uh, about this. And, and, and just kind of do a little report card here. How are you going? These are the acts of the flesh. This is what a life looks like that is, is driven by the operating system of the flesh. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. The acts of the flesh. Now, what what are these exactly? Well, I I heard a helpful definition this week that that I, I want us to use as our working definition in this series. And it goes like this. The acts of the flesh are human coping mechanisms for dealing with the complexity of life in isolation from the influence of the Holy Spirit. The problem we have, guys, that I have and you have is that we live in a physical world that has become sabotaged by evil. And you and I live with a foot in both worlds. If you've given your allegiance to Jesus, the Spirit has taken up residence in your life. But at the same time, we live in physical bodies in a world order that is deeply compromised by evil. We have to figure out what is the right way to live. And so what you and I face every moment of every day is a choice of the will. Which world am I going to live in? In a world driven by my flesh, one driven by law or one driven by the spirit. And they all have different fruit. The flesh uses and destroys. The law judges and excludes. The spirit, however, transforms and loves. The question becomes, will I use the broken and insufficient coping mechanisms of the flesh or will I allow the Holy Spirit to pull me into the direction of life? And Paul understands that sin has some serious inertia. So this list of vices here, they're all broken coping mechanisms to deal with life apart from God. Humans are always looking for the win. No one is trying to bankrupt their life by some kind of decision um, they made in their 30s. Humans act for the win. We do things because we think they will make our lives better. No one is trying to destroy their lives with this stuff, but it's a broken operating system. Let's look at this first grouping, sexual immorality, impurity, and and debauchery. Um, And and parents, it's just about to get PG-13 for about one minute. So um, just just a heads up. Um, Good? All right, here we go. Nothing too bad, but, but it's, it's uh, PG-13. Paul begins his list of broken coping mechanisms with SEX, with, with sex. Now, debauchery is a broad term, which means a, co- a complete lack of self-control regarding sexual decisions uh, that we would make. And it's interesting that Paul starts here. What, what he's saying is that your sexuality is the first place to look if you want to figure out whether or not your life is being pulled in the direction of Jesus by the Spirit. And this is strange to us in the West because we've been discipled by a, by a culture that, that I would argue has a very low view of sex, that sex is merely a recreational activity between two consenting adults. And I would argue uh, that the Christian view of sex is just so much more than that, that this, this profound experience, body, mind, and spirit 
between two people. It's powerful and, and volatile and so important that the scripture, uh, scriptures would describe a beautiful, and beautiful environment of marriage where it can be protected and safe and ideally produce new life within the context of covenant family. I think as, as I've studied them all, the Christian view is actually the highest view of sex in the body and our culture has minimized it to an issue of consent. Now, hear me clearly, consent is of course vital, but it's a low ethical bar for something this powerful. And, and I say this because anyone who's been deeply impacted by sexual sin knows that this is not a light matter. Those are events that deeply shape us and hurt us. And our bodies matter a lot. And if we really wanna know whether or not our lives are hospitable environments for the work of the spirit, the way we navigate sex is a telling guide. That's, that's all I, I have on this for now. But I, I beg you guys, I encourage you to just think really deeply and thoughtfully about this. Paul began here for a reason. Okay, parents, we're back. The second category of acts of the flesh are idolatry and witchcraft. Here he's talking about two activities regarding how we relate to the spiritual realm. Um, idolatry is about giving an allegiance to something or someone that's not a true God. Witchcraft is about viewing spirituality as something uh, that we can control and manipulate. And through witchcraft, you can control and manipulate other people or events. In both instances, uh, our relationship to spirituality is that I'm the boss. And this is actually the polar opposite of how Christianity works. It's, 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 a, it's a life given to the service of others and the service of Jesus. The third category is about relational dysfunction. And this is the largest section which comes as no surprise as you consider the background of this story of people trying to figure out how they can possibly coexist. Um, and the list here is hatred, discourse, uh, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy. Every one of these are character flaws that contribute to unhealthy relationships in our lives. This is clearly on Paul's mind because he's writing to a group of churches who are divided, who are dividing over this really contentious issue of theology and cultural practice. If you want to know which world you're living in more, Paul says, the spirit or the flesh, look at the health of your relationships. And when you do that, you'll see whether your life is a healthy environment for growing spiritual fruit. I, I was chatting with a Christian friend uh, this week who was struggling with how to engage in a healthy way with friends who hold opposing political views online. I had no idea what he was talking about. He, this, he's a super smart guy with a strong handle on scripture. And he just felt like the day before he'd lost a longtime friend over conflicting opinions about the, the president. I appreciated his humility. Um, he essentially adopted a humble posture and asked me to shine a light on any blind spots. Super humble thing for someone to do. A deep sign of spiritual maturity. And he felt like he'd lost another battle with the dark side of his humanity. And he wanted some external advice uh, from his pastor. Now, this friend of mine would, would probably tell you that as an intellectual, very, very smart guy, his, his kryptonite is, is needing to be right about everything all of the time. And he kind of falls apart when uh, from time to time he meets an unreasonable person who doesn't listen or get his thoughtful arguments. This has been and will be a lifelong battle for him, or as Paul would say, a battle with the flesh. And for him, it's rearing its ugly head in, in this season uh, of social distancing, which has honestly thrown us all off uh, center. But we all get a choice. How will we respond to the relationships in our lives as we're sitting there on Facebook? Will we be drawn to life through the operating uh, system of the spirit? Or will we, will we react in dysfunction in our flesh? So I ask you, and Paul would ask you, how are your personal relationships? Are they being pulled towards life and health? Or are there patterns of dysfunction? The final category, uh, drunkenness and orgies, uh, according to some of my favorite commentators, is actually really about worship, um, false religion, culture. Uh, in that culture, these things were connected to the worship of gods in certain temples. And, and now here's the warning in Galatians 5.21. 
I warn you as I did before that those who live like this through this list of vices will not inherit the kingdom of God. His whole point is that you can resist the influence of the spirit in your life to the point that you, according to Paul, would choose not to receive your inheritance of the kingdom of God. Which sidebar, and gosh, this is seven sermons right here. That does make sense. If, if someone truly despises the way of Jesus and the way of the Holy Spirit, why would they want to choose to be in a kingdom uh, where they would have to worship him forever? That would, you, could, you could argue that that would be their actual version uh, of hell. Anyway, again, that's seven sermons, but I just want to throw that out there for you to think about. So this, this vice list is a, is a word picture of what our life is when we surrender to the flesh. And now he, he pivots uh, to a vision of what your life can be. Here Paul explores the nine faceted fruit of the Spirit. So you've got this, uh, this darkness and life in the flesh and then this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now, because human change and maturing is so complica- such a complicated process, Paul helps us understand it with this metaphor of fruit. And anytime you see a New Testament author uh, use a metaphor like that, you've got to do the work in understanding the layers. Otherwise, it is, otherwise it is likely, uh, you will likely miss the entire point and, and you could set your life off um, understanding uh, a theology that's, that's 10% wrong that will, will have you headed in the wrong direction. So Paul in his wisdom uh, uses this metaphor of fruit. So what are the layers here? Well, many of you know this already, but I, but I married a farmer's daughter and I, I highly recommend this. Ma- uh, Mary loves mowing the lawn and, and digging holes and, and loves making gardens. Just last week we borrowed our neighbor's tiller and we, we made another garden bed. We, we lucked out by buying a house in uh, East Nashville in 2014 that had an acre at the back. It has good sun exposure um, and we're able to grow gardens. I bought our house actually without Mary seeing it because she couldn't believe that we could live in East Nashville and have an acre in our backyard. She didn't care about the house. I'm telling you, marry a farmer's daughter. One time I bought Mary dirt for her birthday and she was overjoyed. (laughs) Now here's, here's what I know about gardening. It's really fun when you're harvesting the food, but it is so much work. It's 99% hard work and and 1% Instagram humble bragging. There's weeding, fencing, building, watering, digging. You'll find yourself Googling mold uh, online. It's not like you just put a seed in the ground and come back six weeks later and, and, and then feed your entire family. Now, if you did that, um, you, would, you would see a partial harvest. Some of the really strong plants would survive, but it wouldn't be bountiful because growing food, growing fruit takes work. If you want to make a plot of ground produce lots of fruit, you have to learn how to be a gardener. And I want you to place yourself in the middle of this metaphor, not thinking of yourself as the fruit or the tree or the vine or anything like that. Think of yourself in this particular metaphor as the gardener. We planted a peach tree a few years ago and last year it produced one piece of fruit and man, we were were so pumped about that. But then something came and and ate it and and destroyed the tree. Uh, Probably one of those street smart East Nashville deer that survived somehow and, uh, and the deer ate it before it was fully ripe. So not only do you need to know how to be a gardener, you also need to have a plan for saving fruit from external attack. Gardening is, is way primal, guys. You literally battle with nature all of the way. Growing fruit takes an enormous amount of work to create and, and, and it takes just so much work to maintain an environment where it will actually grow and be bountiful. But then you also have to do battle with this outside influence. The the beasts of the land literally want to come and take your fruit. Now, here's an important observation. After the enormous amount of work that Mary and I did to protect and defend and make the garden grow some fruit, is is it accurate for me to sit down at the meal and say, I grew this peach? Now, think about that for a second. Can I say that? Can I say, I grew this peach. I want to argue, no, not really. That's not entirely true. 
all I did, what was important, what I did was play the role of gardener and put a whole lot of effort to provide an environment where fruit could be grown. But how does the fruit actually grow? Well, it turns out that now I have this side hustle of, of being a uh, homeschool teacher and my seventh grade uh, uh, science textbook will tell you that food grows because the sun emits a huge amount of energy, which is crucial to growing fruit. How much control do I have over the power of the sun? Not much. I can cut down some nearby trees, uh, but that's about it. How much control do I have over the genetic structure of the peach tree? Zero. Then there's this whole process of photosynthesis and respiration and the carbon dioxide doing all the stuff that the carbon dioxide does. Again, I have no control over those things. And that's actually what really grows the peaches. Yet, my role as the gardener is, is crucial, isn't it? I do not grow the fruit, but I can hinder the growth of the fruit if I don't play my role of gardener well. So here's how the fruit metaphor works for spiritual growth. When the spirit's at work in my life, the fruit comes about because of this outside influence of the spirit who's trying to address stuff in my life to make me more like Jesus. And I'm not in control of that. The fruit comes from something larger than myself. I cannot make meaningful change to my character by just trying harder. It's nuanced. It's probably Bonhoeffer for the win when he says this. Fruit is always the miraculous, the created. It is never the result of willing, but always a growth. The fruit of the spirit is a gift of God and only he can produce it. They who bear it know as little about it as the tree knows of its fruit. They know only the power of him on whom their life depends. So I'll say this, you and I can't take a ton of credit for inner growth, but we play a vital role and we can hinder this growth process. We can do all kinds of things that will minimize the work of, spirit, of the spirit in our lives. And that was me in my early 30s, following Jesus and becoming a worse human being by doing stuff that hindered the growth of the fruit of the spirit. So remember, the Holy Spirit is pouring redemptive energy into our lives and pulling us towards life. But there's moments, there's external forces, the metaphorical wild idea of Inglewood um, where, where conflict uh, is, is unavoidable. How then do we live? Life in the spirit, life in the flesh, as Christians really with a foot in both world. What does it mean to practically engage with this? Hey, what, as, I, as I close this out, why don't you start distributing communion uh, amongst yourselves? How then shall we live? The way this works out is actually very practical and, and, and kind of fast to explain. I, I want you to imagine you're in a tense moment uh, with someone and the thought comes into your mind, here's what I could really say. If I said this, this, this would just, this would crush them. This would make them feel uh, very small. So that, that comes into your head and then another voice says, that's not the kind of human you want to be. I want to be better than that. And this is all happening inside your head in that God-given God -given gap between stimulus and response. And depending on which reality you've been feeding more lately, the spirit or the flesh will determine a lot on how that conflict is going to go. The fruit of the Spirit is Jesus' beautiful vision for your life. That if you open, uh, that if you will open yourself to the power of the Holy Spirit, these things with careful gardening at your end will become true of you. And over the next nine weeks, we'll be looking at each of these facets of the fruit of the Spirit. But as we do, we must all keep in mind this metaphor that the fruit grows because of the work of the spirit. We have an important role, but we didn't grow the fruit. One of the greatest arguments against Christianity that I hear in our post, uh, in our postmodern secular humanist context up in the city is that it seems that many Christians become old and cranky and religious and disengaged as they age. And they become kind of like these subhuman type of humans who just don't feel things anymore. Paul's saying here that the most fully human, the best way to be human that there possibly is, is in people who have full control over their impulses and their desires. And they allow the spirit to pull them into a deeper type of humanity in becoming more like Jesus. And we live in surrender 
to the spirit. As we live and surrender to the Spirit, we, we are gardening our souls by making choices uh, that will make our lives an even more hospitable garden. And, and you know, so for example, this, this is how it works. Um, maybe your smartphone is killing you because of porn. And remember that the, 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 the sexual dysfunction was that the first of the vices in, uh, in, in Paul's list here. Here's what I think how Paul would say this works in tending to your garden. Get a flip phone. Go to someone you trust and confess and get a flip phone, be sober for 90 days, see what happens. Sort of do the gardening work, pull out that weed. The art is getting serious about the reality of the acts of the flesh. And when you see them, you act decisively. And in doing so, you make the garden more hospitable for the work of the spirit and you'll be pulled towards a healthier life. So in my early 30s, uh, I was becoming worse and I knew it. Part of what I did um, was I, I wanted to understand spiritual formation and how could I become the kind of man that I wanted to be. And I studied a lot of Paul's theology, especially his virtue list in 1 Corinthians 13, because I realized I wasn't doing a good job of loving people outside of my immediate family. And I spent the year meditating on, on the words in his list. He, he would say that love is patient and kind. And, and I spent the next year just in every situation in that gap between stimulus and response going, what is the patient and what is the kind thing to do? And in doing so, um, I began cooperating with the spirit, tending to the garden uh, of my soul. And with time, it gave the spirit more access to my heart. And, um, and I started to see some tremendous progress. So over the next nine weeks, this is the plan. We'll be looking at what it means to play the role of gardener uh, of our own souls while working in cooperation with the external power of the Holy Spirit. Changing your heart is a long process and, and I'm excited to join you on this long journey. And as we are gathered around tables, uh, metaphorical tables in our houses, in our neighborhoods, in communities spread across our city. We got people watching uh, from our church watching um, for wherever they're posting up all across the country uh, and, and across, the road, across the world. Together, let's remember that this is grace-filled theology. Need to hear that. This is grace-filled theology. And, and this is beautiful imagery here, the body of Jesus broken for you. Let's see. And the blood of Jesus spilt for the forgiveness of your sins. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for this spiritual family um, that you've given us. And as I feel the weight of shepherding well, of us, of us becoming uh, a people who are known uh, for the fruit, in our lives, that, that we would grow to be a congregation of lovely 80-year-olds who've, who've given access of our heart uh, over to you. Jesus, we acknowledge um, that we can stand in the way, but it's really your spirit that does that work. And in this moment, Jesus, I ask for me and my family and for whoever's willing, Jesus, would you do that work in my heart? Would I become a man um, with a bountiful harvest of the fruit of the spirit? in my life. And I ask this in your name. Amen. Well, guys, uh, I'm excited uh, about this series. Uh, we will be invited. It's been something I've been wanting to do for a while. Uh, we'll be joined by a handful of friends and spiritual heroes of mine for, for a couple of these uh, talks. Andy Crouch um, will be giving a talk on self-control and technology at the end of this series. And uh, we're working on a few more. Next week, I'm, in, I'm thrilled to invite Senior Pastor Darren Whitehead to address us about gardening for the fruit of love. Guys, I love you. Um, why don't you go to the website right now or the app and check out the Around the Table resource. And why don't you reach out to some people, eat a meal together, probably by Zoom, and talk about this in more detail. I love you so much. I can't wait to see you. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.